Hello, I'm Graham Fitch and welcome to this month's practice clinic where I address questions that have been sent in in advance by Online Academy subscribers. All the details for the Online Academy are in the description below, so do check that out if you would like to become a member and have your questions answered. So what we do is, the questions are usually, they're supposed to be concerned with practice, but it's also areas of technique, pedaling, style, um, anything that relates to your day-to-day -day piano practice is fine. So Jamie asks, I'm currently working on Schubert's D889 Serenade Stentchen, that Schubert list, uh, arranged by list, and I stumble on the left-hand leaps throughout along with where to pedal. Any advice, please? Okay, so if, if we look at this rather lovely, um, actually extraordinarily lovely piece, we've got a few... I mean, query marks. And now, in the edition that I have at home, um, the pedaling is, has been put in by Emil von Sauer, who was Liszt's student. This is the Peters edition, the old Peters edition, which you could probably find on IMSLP without any difficulty, along with other editions which may very well have pedaling. So, if your score happens not to have any pedaling marked in, check out other editions and try out the pedaling suggestions that come from there, bearing in mind that no edition that I've ever seen um, has even attempted to notate things like partial pedal, uh, quick pedal changes, flutter pedal, where we sustain a bass note and clear up uh, dissonance above. Uh, no edition can, can do that. So at the beginning, what we find is long bass notes and staccato. <laughs> However, I, I did a little bit of research on this uh, yesterday and I discovered that only one player that I heard does the staccato without any pedal. And she did it beautifully. Most players are using pedal. And just playing very lightly. here I'm following the recipe from von Sauer which is to use one pedal for the whole measure and you're probably scratching your head thinking, how can I pedal that in one pedal? You have to really balance the sound very beautifully in order to do it well. So what I've got is a very strongly projected melodic line, Espressivo il Canto. It's a song. If you listen to the original Schubert song, which I'm sure you've done, I think it would be a, a crime not to know your Schubert song and to have listened to many different recordings of it uh, before you tackle this piece. It's all about the song. The accompaniment is very backgroundy. Uh, the, the background material is a bass note, sustained through the whole bar, but since we have to let go of that bass note in order to come up and play our... I play that... I play all the quavers in my left hand here. Which means my right hand is free can't always do that and it wouldn't always be advisable to do that but where you can you can let the left hand take over some of the notes that are written for the in in the treble stave for the right hand so what I've got there is a very firmly projected right hand sung right hand with a very light left hand I don't want to have too much bass because my bass is just going to be present in the pedal for the whole bar and I want to play these eighth notes these quavers with a staccato touch, right? So if I then think of the dynamic levels, let's say I've got, I don't know what that is. Beautiful. Uh, uh, probably a metaforte, let's, let's go with that for now, metaforte, and then pianissimo underneath. When I combine that, I would 
would use my right hand for the, for the quavers. Back to the left hand, a little bit less here. That's the chorus, if you will. That's actually the piano part in the original song. So we wouldn't play this with the same projection. So if your tonal balances are good and your staccato touch is good, you can get away with the um, long pedals per bar. It doesn't mean that you can't adjust them from time to time. Um, for example, if I wanted to clear my sound, I'm doing a flutter pedal there, which doesn't touch the bass note. Let me show you. Uh, you won't be able to see my foot, <laughs> but I'll tell you what my foot's doing. So my foot is vibrating on the pedal, and the damper hasn't really affected that A. But if I were to do the same job with, with an A in this register, can you hear that's gone already? I'm doing the same thing. So it means that I can hold on to that note in the pedal and just clear my sound out a little bit there if I want by vibrating. So that's one option. That's a very advanced type of pedaling. Um, now, the question relates to jumps as well, the left hand jumps. So let's look, well, let, let's take that spot where I was just then. Any with any jump, we have to release the key that we're jumping from and land on the key that we're jumping to. Up, down. Now that movement has to be free. The arm has to be free as I make the jump. If I carry tension with me, I will slow the movement down and it'll end up feeling uncoordinated and inaccurate. So what I do first of all, just explore this. Have your hand on the A uh, octave and just propel your arm off from it. I'm not going to use any pedal. I'm just going to lift up and then land in my lap. And make sure that when I land in my lap that the arm is free. So up, down. Now my next job is to land where I want to go, which is the fifth and fourth finger on the A and the G. So jump, land, and you notice when I land, I'm cushioning with my wrist, so I don't want anything rigid in my arm. So you're probably thinking, well, that's all right. You seem to be able to do that well. How do, how do you do that? Well, if you can't do that easily, then there are various things you can do to measure the distance. And I'm gonna show you them now. One is called quick cover. So what I do with a quick cover, I hold on to this first note and then I make the movement very fast, but I don't play the keys. I'm making sure that I'm dead accurate on five and four. Yes, I am, so I'm gonna play. So you notice that I got there quickly and directly. I didn't do this sort of stuff. I wouldn't accept that, throw that back. So once I can do that and measure the distance, then I can do my springboarding, which is up, down. Let's say, for argument's sake, I've got a three note chord. Actually, I'm going to take from bar 27 and go to that three note chord. I've got another way I can practice that. I can jump and land on one note. Let me go to my second finger. And then I touch in the other fingers afterwards. Selected landing. Now let me go to the third finger touch the other notes in, let me go to the pinky finger, and then touch the other notes in, let me go to two and three, and touch the remaining finger in, let me go to two and five, let me go to three and five, and now let me go to the whole thing. So I've got the propulsion, the freedom in the journey, and then the landing, confident landing, and then... That is very comfortable for me. I don't have to worry about landing on the wrong note. I can do the same job from the last eighth note of each bar to the next uh, bass. A quick cover first would look like this. Yes, I'm dead center of the key. If I wanted to be really fussy, a, a millimeter, I went a millimeter too far. I'd still get the right note, but yes, that's fine. And now the springboarding. And those are some ways that you can practice the jumps. I hope that helps that with that question there, Jamie. 
Um, next question is from Catherine. She'd like some advice on how to play Study in F. That's the spinning song by Stephen Heller, Opus 45, number 19. I'm happy with my playing at a slow tempo and am able to balance the voices reasonably well, but struggle to achieve anything approaching the recommended tempo. Um, dotted crotchet equals 76. The main point of difficulty is in bars three to four, where the right hand melody notes are played with the fifth finger. These are tr tricky to coordinate precisely with the accompanying right hand notes. I'll show you in a second. Um, and she says that when she uses a metronome, she discovers she tends to slow down slightly in those two bars. So please could you give me some advice on how to achieve a faster tempo without sacrificing expressive details? It's a really good question. Um, okay, so the, 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 let me just break this down a little bit. We've got a melodic line on the top. It's interrupted by rests, that tune. The left hand underneath. Broken chords in a kind of arch shape. So let me put together those two elements. And then the thing that ties that all together, the spinning component, if you will is a trill in the right hand between one and two. Okay, that's the opening phrase, the opening paragraph, if you will. No, okay, so the first thing I would suggest doing there would be to play, to be able to play very expressively at your tempo the, without the trill. So just forget that the trill even exists. Use the fingering that you will use in performance and work on that. And that the pedal will take care of the connection there. So you don't have to worry about physical finger legato. Neither do you need to worry about holding on. When we do get to the trill, I'll show you, you don't need to worry about being quite so particular about finger legato when we've got a trill going on. So let me next suggest just putting down the fingers one and two on C and D. But when we're holding on to notes on the piano for the purposes of practice, it's important not to be key bedding into those notes. So what I'm able to do is to move. Do you see how I'm able to slide along and I'm able to move my wrist and be very free? So what I'm going to do now is to do exactly the same as I just did before, but with the one and two held down. And I did, I had a very strong sense then that when I played my, my pinky on the B flat, my one and two had slid further back along the key and then back out again. So there's a journey there with one and two and that journey will exist when you add the trill. So as long as the trill is flexible along the length of the key and in the wrist, you should find that you can rely on the pedal to make connections. Let me play without the pedal I'm going to go from bars three and four, the spot that you were questioning. Now I can join three to five, but I wouldn't necessarily have to, so. So what I would suggest for practice is to, not, not so much play staccato, but to release the, the melody notes. Don't feel like you are, uh, you have to connect them physically by hand. So the practice would be this. Now, another thing you'll, you'll probably notice that I'm doing there is using my wrist. So let me show you how we can do that. Let me do a down up motion. I'm gonna start off by practicing down, up, down, up. On each uh, C, I drop in, and each thumb note I drop in. 
On each second finger note, I rise up. Up. Now, we won't play exactly like this, but it's a very good exercise. Up. See, I'm not holding on to that A. Now, can I do that quicker? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop into every melody note. Drop, drop, and gradually rise here. You see how I rose up over the course of four notes? So what it is is a drop, lift a little bit, lift a little bit more, lift a little bit more. And as I, as I um, lift my wrist here, I'm moving backwards along the key so that I'm in position for this drop, down, up, drop, lift, 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 drop, lift, drop. Okay, now that may seem very complex, but when you play, you don't have to think about that. What you'll find is you can use your flexible wrist. And I hope that sounded beautiful. What I did there was to allow the pedal to take care of the connections. If you find you can connect, I like that connection for myself. And maybe that connection at the end feels more controlled with a finger legato. But the others, I don't have to worry about that. Um, I think that probably covers the question. I hope it covers the question. The, the music goes on and the trill now goes to the left hand. of music uh, go, goes on there so again you can do the same job hold on to two and one uh, here this is more difficult to hold on to the trill notes but you could now is it possible to join three to two yes is it advisable maybe is it necessary no so I could lift everything and then play here. And pedal will do the connection. Down, up. Just one little thing about the ending. Uh, I see a lot of people uh, do this kind of business. Let me see if I can do it. At the end, we've got this rather lovely kind of, um, well, I'll show you. pattern in the left hand. Bass note with the pinky and then a kind of a trill job at the top. Now, it, it, a lot of people do this sort of thing. They think, and it's intuitively good, well my pinky, I need my pinky again, so let me just keep it down there. And then they do things like this. Can you see, I've got this horrible stretch in my hand and the contorted hand position. And yes, I do need to play my pinky uh, every sixth note but I do not want to keep my hand stretched out. So when I play my thumb, I allow the pinky to come back in and join the hand. And just to free this up, a little bit of a rotation there. Yeah, and if you want to just develop that sensation and you like practicing exercises, make a little exercise out of a scale. Of idea, let the right hand join in if you want, do it in symmetrical inversion for fun, just a, an idea. Pat um, asks about again, we have Brahms opus 118, number two. We had that in last month's clinic, it's a very popular piece, and I'm not surprised, it's one of the most gorgeous short piano pieces ever. I don't imagine that it could ever be surpassed in its beauty. So Pat asks, Graham mentions knowing chords thoroughly. I'm wondering if that means the structure based on the key signature or the particular chords in a piece. I would appreciate some advice for methods to analyze chords in a piece, to know them back to front. As an example, any portion of Brahms at Opus 118, number two, 
would be good. Thank you. Okay, so um, I've got my own study edition here of the Brahms, with, um, which we publish. Uh, the details are below in the description. We've got here an Urtext edition of the score in the front, uh, a walkthrough of the various sections uh, with QR codes, so you can scan the QR codes and it takes you to a video. And we've also got little videos in the annotated practice edition with, uh, you know, footnotes that help you with various spots and give you maybe a few little exercises to practice as well along the road. So I'm just going to use the um, Urtex version of the score at the front here and just have a little look at the harmony. So it, the thing, Pat, the thing with harmony is the harmonic labels like dominant seventh or um, diminished chord, they, they're just labels. We have to understand how these chords function, how they sound. So very basically, um, since we're in the key of A major, we've got major chord, we've got minor chord, we've got diminished chord, and we've got augmented chord. And each of those has its own set of emojis, depending on the musical context and the, vo the volume. So if I'm playing an A major chord, triad I've probably got a smiley face there uh, the sun sunshine face you know if I play the minor chord softly we've probably got the sad face if I play it loudly we've probably got the angry face right if I play the diminished chord we've got the furrowed eyebrows and you know this kind of position if I play the augmented chord we've got the wide eyes and the open mouth, all these chords, all these qualities of chords express something uh, slightly different. Then we've got chords with added notes, so I can add the sixth, and that gives us a kind of a jazzy flavor. I can add the seventh, which gives us a different quality. Uh, then we've got things like cadences, plagal cadence, chord four to chord one, and then I've got perfect cadence, chord five to chord one, that's very, um, final isn't it the perfect cadence and then we've got the interrupted cadence chord five to chord six yeah and um, that's an interruption so you don't have to necessarily know all the labels to be able to hear the music and to be able to interpret the music it just adds an extra layer of value to your appreciation of the music and to your ability to transfer skills from one piece to the next so if I'm playing the opening of this, this piece, I know I'm in the key of A major. Now I've got chord four there, yeah. Chord four has, has a kind of plagal quality. The Amen cadence is chord four to chord one, peaceful ending. So there's a kind of, maybe this, the chord four evokes a spiritual feeling to the piece. Uh, dominant seventh which is chord five with a seven on the top in its last inversion with the D the seventh at the bottom now that has such a strong pull to the tonic chord in its first inversion in fact it can really only go there so what does that mean in terms of the musical expression well it tells me that there's a kind of confidence in this harmony If I compare that with the later phrase, Brahms does the same sort of music, but with a little variation or two. So let me play you the original. Now let me play you the second version, bars 10, 11. Let's look at some of those harmonic differences. Well, at the beginning of bar 11, we have the diminished chord, which expresses not confidence, it, it expresses the opposite of confidence. It expresses, it could be anxiety, it could be uh, doubt. And that's 
an emotional response to the harmony, which you could do just by hearing it and just really listening to the sound. But if you should happen to know, ah, that's a dominant seventh in its last inversion, whereas this is a diminished seventh, it adds one extra layer of appreciation and understanding of, of how the music works. It's not 100% necessary to know what the chords are, but it's very helpful. I think it is more important to know what key we're in at any given moment. And I particularly like it when we get to the end of the phrase. I'm now looking at bar four. And the tenor voice throws in the G natural, which cancels the temptation or the tendency to go toward the dominant key, doesn't it? It's almost going to the subdominant key. to D major does he he goes to the chord of D then he says actually I need to get to my dominant key don't I I'd better introduce a secondary dominant in other words the dominant of the dominant which helps me get to the dominant key more easily it helps me establish my dominant key and you can feel the modulation here to the key of E major, the dominant key. This is all really, it's all gravy. We don't need it, but it's super helpful to know. It's also su super helpful to know that in the B section, we've gone to the relative minor. So if I pick it up from bar 47, and this, by the way, is the first really strong cadence into the home key. A major isn't fully established, firmly established, until the end of the section. It's a miracle that Brahms can do that. And what that does is it creates a great big arch from the beginning of the piece all the way over to the end. Bar 47 bars later, we finally establish the home key. <laughs> then, having established it, he goes away from it. That C sharp is ambiguous. Does it mean it's the third of A major? It could do. We won't know until here when it becomes the fifth degree of F sharp minor and then we have our uh, the major the tonic major of the relative major of minor for the miraculous middle section within the middle section so there, there, are, there are some really gorgeous moments harmonically to admire and to appreciate that are of secondary importance to one's ability to play the piece musically. Um, so just to finish with, with this, I would suggest that anybody who wants to expand their harmonic knowledge just takes uh, theory classes, theory lessons, harmony lessons, harmony classes. You can do this so easily nowadays online. We are able to offer a few recommendations. See the description below. Um, any uh, reputable community college would be able to uh, supply a good harmony theory course, uh, certainly in the UK and I'm sure elsewhere in the world too. Um, you can do this online with no difficulty nowadays. So I hope that gives you some thoughts. And finally, a, a question from Will. What are the protocols for playing rolled chords, such as playing the left hand before the right or playing both hands together? And then Will gives a few examples, Debussy's Dance Bohemienne um, and a couple of others. What happens if the roll chord is just in one hand um, and then do I start the arpeggio on or before the beat? Big questions. We do have um, a section in the online academy about rolled chords where I do go into quite some detail about the different ways of rolling chords uh, in the different style periods. But just, just very quickly, I'm looking at the Dance Bohemienne of Debussy, which starts off with a B minor chord, uh, rolled, so the left hand's got an arpeggio uh, sign, and then the left hand has the wavy arpeggio sign, which leads one to suspect that the spreads start together. And if I do that fast, so slow motion, in fast motion, what I feel like I'm doing when I arpeggiate that chord is just plucking it out of the keyboard. 
am I concerned that the hands start together and end together? Or could it be, could it be this? I'm not particularly concerned. And I don't think composers are always very clear on the difference between the arpeggiation sign that goes from the top, from the bottom to the top in one wavy line, or whether there are two wavy lines. Officially, in the theory textbooks, when, when you get two wavy lines, you're supposed to start the spreads together in each hand. So... I don't really know what I'm doing there. I'm just ripping the chord out of the keyboard. However, in the next example, we'll give C Chopin Nocturne in F minor, Opus 55, number one, the ending. You've got here the same arpeggiation signs. I'm doing it according to textbooks. Starting and ending together. I don't think I would want to do that. I think I'd want to start from the bass and roll up. Play the left hand first and then the right hand. So then I, I thought about it for a bit, mm -hmm, scratched my head and then went and listened to Arthur Rubinstein, who is probably one of the leading exponents of Chopin's style from the bygone Romantic age era of pianism. He does them from the bottom to the top. So I don't think there's any real consistency about how people realise these indications. One thing that is important to, to know is that you can vary the spread. So maybe, let me just do them. Sforzando. And maybe here a little faster spread. And then to slow. So the speeds of the spread are at the whim of the, or according to the good taste of the performer. I was working with somebody the other day on Liszt's Un Sospiro, where we've got these big uh, spread chords in the right hand, which are so luxurious and generous in their spacing, so that if you play the spread before the bead, what we get is we don't sustain the lower notes. So the solution is to put the spread on the beat. So if I do that slow motion. And the right thumb together with the left hand bass note. So the melody note comes up, sorry, wrong notes there. The melody note comes a little later. There's, no, there's nothing to, to, that disturbs us about that. And when you're practicing it slowly, you could coincide. Maybe the melody note can come together with the D sharp. No, that's a C natural. In some editions, it's interesting, you've got a C natural there. In some editions, it's actually a C sharp. But the idea there would be to put the lowest note of the right hand together with the bass note. Then you're, you capture the whole of the, the chord in the pedal. So often putting the spread on the beat is, is a good solution for situations like that where you don't want to smudge. That brings me to the end of this month's practice clinic. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll look forward to seeing you next month.